first, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for your invitation to, to take part to uh, this uh, conference here at La Maison Française. It's a privilege to, to take part to this debate here in one of the most prestigious universities in America with an eminent professor in front of students coming from many different countries who are bound to become the decision makers of the next decades. As you may know, uh, and it was recorded, I came to New York in order to take part to a special session of the United Nations General Assembly on the fight against anti-Semitism. And this session was planned before the attack in Paris. And of course, it takes another dimension after those events. Yesterday, representatives of the wide majority from the member states of the organization expressed their firm commitment to intensify the fight against the plight that is threatening even the core of our democratic societies. The moment is highly symbolic since we will be commemorating in only a few days the 17th anniversary of the liberation of uh, the Nazi concentration camp of Auschwitz, 17th anniversary in a few months of the defeat of uh, the Nazi regime, and we, we could hope and, and, and we could have thought that uh, 17 years after anti-Semitism would have been eradicated <laughs> from uh, our society. But uh, the reality is that it is still here in our societies, both uh, under the um, ancient forms uh, coming from centuries but also with new kind of uh, <coughs> uh, ideology, sometimes uh, using new forms of, so of, uh, of tools like the internet, the social networks, which are tools of freedom, of liberty, but we, which are used also to diffuse uh, this uh, ideology, ideology of hatred and, and violence, sometimes using uh, as a pretext in the conflict in the Middle East and the hatred of Israel and the denial of its uh, right to exist and also uh, having a strong impact on probably uh, a part of young generation who are not, who are not uh, aware of uh, the history. And this is a reality. We cannot choose to ignore it. We have to, to recognize it. Over the past few years, we have witnessed in France and in many other European countries an increasing number of attacks, especially directed towards the Jewish community. And sadly, these attacks did not raise the indignation that uh, we could have expected among uh, the population. The tragic terrorist attack in Paris, the 7th of uh, January and the 8th and the 9th of January, the seventh, it was against uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, cartoonists and journalists. After that, policemen who were killed because they protected the journalists and because they were policemen. And then they attacked against this uh, cashier uh, magazine at the port de Vincennes, where the terrorist uh, goes because he wanted to kill Jewish people. And he kills four people just because they were Jews. And that happens in France, where already in uh, 2012 there was this uh, uh, assassination of uh, Jewish people, Jewish children in Toulouse. That happens a few months after an attack against the uh, uh, Jewish Museum of Brussels, where four people were killed by another terrorists. This happened about the, uh, after the killing uh, a few years ago of Ilan Alimi uh, in another place of uh, the region of, uh, of Paris. And uh, despite this tragedy, um, I want to see a light of hope in the fact that the country proved its ability to overcome its sorrow and its fear in order to defend its fundamental value. On the 11th of January, 4 million of people 
with representatives of more than uh, 40 countries, with their leader, head of state and government, were in the streets of Paris and other countries, uh, other cities of, uh, of France, to say that they will refuse uh, to, uh, to, to see, to, uh, to terror, and uh, that they will uh, uh, combat this terrorism and defend the value of freedom, of liberty, of an open society, of brotherhood, that they will uh, stand firm in front of uh, jihadism, of uh, radical Islamism, but they, they will not be in war against the religion, against Islam and Muslim as a whole. And this was very important for us, but also uh, to have this international solidarity expressed, and, and which was expressed by the presence of uh, this head of state and government, but also with a lot of uh, gathering uh, uh, everywhere in the world in front of the French embassies, but also uh, on the social networks where we saw this uh, Je suis Charlie uh, symbol <coughs> took by, by many people, many citizens. So we have, of course, now to fight this. France is uh, mobilized for, for that. In some aspects, we could think about the reaction of the people of New York after the 9-11 Attack. I was there a few days after when the flights were reopened, and I remember of the gathering of people at the Union Square <coughs> with uh, all uh, the posters, with uh, the figure of uh, the victims, and uh, the fraternity among the people, uh, the willingness to uh, preserve uh, the value of New York, the value of the United States and uh, also, of course, to, to refuse to, uh, uh, to be afraid by the terror, even if everybody can be afraid by uh, this uh, violence. Um, of course, we have to uh, answer to this at uh, European level too, in terms of um, reinforcing um, our solidarity for um, the action in terms of uh, police, of justice, of uh, intelligence, but it's not only about that. It's more fundamental uh, than that. We have uh, to act in different uh, directions. The early detection of radicalizing uh, people, the fight against the terrorist propaganda, uh, the prevention of young people departure to jihadist training camps, the counter-narrative, uh, that we can propose to uh, this uh, propaganda of aid, uh, the responsibility also of the internet companies, which is something very difficult, where you have to balance the freedom of expression with the fight against the uh, aid train and, and, and the call for, for murder. Um, of course, an absolute uh, fairness in the, the repression uh, towards <coughs> networks, uh, the fact that we will have to deal with uh, uh, an incredible, uh, increasing number of foreign fighters, more than uh, 1,400 people uh, from France have gone or tried to go uh, to uh, Iraq and, and Syria to join uh, the uh, so-called Islamic State. Um, some have uh, managed to, to go there, some just tried and uh, were identified to, to go to Turkey, for example. Some are in link with uh, these networks. And you have to, to add to this probably 300, 400 people who were linked to previous uh, terrorist groups uh, active in Iraq, in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan, in uh, Pakistan, uh, in Yemen, as well as two of the terrorist uh, toward the Charlie Hebdo reduction. There is a <coughs> dimension which is the work to do in terms of education. Education um, against uh, uh, anti-Semitism, against uh, radicalization, but also uh, citizenship education, integration to the uh, democratic value of, uh, of the society. And of course, there is the social dimension itself. 
It's not possible, I think, to have just a simple explanation of why some young people became member of this uh, terrorist action. But obviously, when you look at it, you see it's a problem of uh, sometimes uh, scholarship failure, social exclusion, the problem of prison, some of them going to prison for other reasons, not because they were linked to terrorist uh, activity, because of criminality activities, but becoming in prison, in touch with uh, former terrorist uh, activists, and then being fascinated by uh, these groups and becoming themselves um, active in terrorist uh, groups. And it, it will be a long fight. It will be a, a fight uh, to preserve the security of the citizens, of the people, to refuse this idea that people could be frightened to live in our country just because they are Jews, to refuse the idea that a cartoonist could be in danger just because they do cartoons, just because he tried to uh, uh, make people uh, able to laugh, laugh about themselves, laugh about their own belief, laugh about uh, uh, some kind of institution, clerical mm -hmm. or political or, or social institutions. That's part of our view of freedom. It's not a provocation, or perhaps it is sometimes a provocation uh, and that's part of our conception of, of liberty. It's not to insult anyone, but it's because we have tried to, from century to be societies of, of freedom. And we cannot, of course, accept the idea to live under threat, under threat of, of, uh, of terror, of uh, violent attack. But we know uh, and I really underline that, that the answer is not just a matter of security. It's a matter of uh, uh, answering to, to the, the core reason which uh, do that some people can, can become members of this terrorist group. Of course, another part of the, the problem is that it's linked to what happens in some countries uh, in the Islamic world where there is a kind of uh, war of religion, but we don't want to be part of a war of religion. We are not, I say it again, at war against a religion. We are at war against terror, uh, against uh, jihadism, uh, but not uh, against Islam or Muslim people. And this terrorist group, which claim to be representative of uh, Islam, they killed a lot of Muslim, they kill the uh, she, she, she people, she, she are people because they are Sunni, or other Sunni people because they consider they don't practice uh, religion as they consider it has to be. They kill the Yazidis, they kill Christian people. But we have to deal with the uh, decomposition of, uh, of state in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya. Um, even if we don't have to decide of the, <laughs> the future of this country, but we cannot uh, just uh, consider that we will not interfere. That's why we had to uh, uh, take action in Mali, for example, where we managed to organize the democratic transition. But of course, it's not up only to France and to one country uh, to take uh, care of this situation. It's up to African countries, to Arab countries, to the United Nations, to other European uh, countries. <coughs> Every country in the world, I think, is now aware of the reality of this uh, terrorist threat, and many of them are willing to increase their effort in order to provide this threat with an adequate answer, and uh, we need this, uh, this global answer. There are many very concrete aspects we are discussing now in Europe. For example, the passenger names recall uh, regulation, which we will, uh, which which means that the travel of the uh, uh, aircraft agency will, will have to transmit uh, the uh, record about their passengers 
uh, to the intelligence service, something which already exists between the US and Europe, but which doesn't exist inside Europe. Obviously, Europe was not, is not uh, now equipped to answer that kind of issue. That's why there will be a summit of the head of state and government, the 12th of February, uh, to treat of this uh, question. But um, it was also very important to say that we, we will answer by, by, with our democratic values. I also hope that this uh, tragic attack in Paris will increase the awareness of the importance of uh, the terrorist threat and will convince our partner to the necessity to progress on this point. Terrorists wanted to frighten and to divide us, then our answer must be the exact opposite. We must stand firm and we must be united and show our determination to preserve uh, our value. I look forward uh, to debating with you uh, on this issue or other issue you would like to raise. But obviously, even if uh, that's just a part of the discussion we can have, that's of course our main preoccupation today. Thank you very much. shock and fright, uh, a lot of revenge talk, uh, a lot of uh, uh, discussion of you know, military security, and that might have been ultimately after the solidarity that we saw uh, a way of moving uh, uh, so a lot of the solution, a lot of the public debate. Uh, we might come back to that question that I put in. My, my sense is that at moments like this, tragic moments like this, it's always really important to keep separate the expressions and feelings and statements of mourning today from the uh, feelings and expressions and statements of politics. Um, and, uh, and I think it's, it's often when those two kind of get uh, brought together too much that there are often the kind of reactions that maybe you were referring to earlier. Um, and, and, I, and I think that in France there's been a good, a good, it's been a good example of keeping those two, I think, relatively apart. Um, and so um, the distinction, for instance, is in the, you know, je suis Charlie and je ne suis pas Charlie, right? Which, to a certain extent, I think one is an, one is an expression of mourning, possibly. Uh, and one is a political expression. And, uh, and it, there's a lot of conflict when the expression of mourning kind of clashes with a political expression, which is not about the mourning, but about the politics, really. Um, and so, but overall, I think that the, the French government and the, f and, uh, and, and, and the public have been pretty good at keeping apart mourning and politics. And I thought maybe I could raise three dimensions of that. Um, so one would be, uh, first, positively, I think, was uh, resisting immediate calls for a French Patriot Act. Um, and, uh, and so, um, uh, I think that that was a, at least, well, it's still, obviously, there's still discussions ongoing and whatnot, but that is one area in which it's often that the, the, uh, the revenge and the politics blend in a uh, problematic way. So one area to talk about would be that, resisting the Patriot Act. The second is the kinds, of, the kind of discourse that is uh, presented in part by the government. Um, and um, I was noticing, for instance, in your talk yesterday at the United Nations, and obviously it's a different, it's a, it's a different context because it's a summit on anti-Semitism, but um, you spoke a lot about racism and anti-Semitism. Um, and it strikes me that it's possible that we should be adding Islamophobia to that uh, in that kind of discursive intervention. So when we talk about the problems of racism or and anti-Semitism, maybe we want to add Islamophobia. So that would be a second dimension. And then the third is the uh, calls for, and so this is along the educational dimension, uh, for zero tolerance. Um, now, 
uh, zero tolerance in schools, uh, particularly in the educational setting, um, for any uh, acts that could be perceived as being uh, an affront to the values of uh, liberalism and uh, the French Republic. And uh, on that score, I'm more troubled um, uh, by calls for zero tolerance because it's not, I'm not exactly clear. It's not exactly clear to me, and I've done a lot of research in the American context on zero tolerance, uh, that enforcing uh, forms of order in that way actually produce the results that we're looking for. So I would kind of open up the conversation in those three directions. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Arco. Uh, I think you're right that uh, it's necessary uh, to um, be aware of the uh, distinction between uh, emotional reaction, uh, which, which is a very important part of the capability of the society to, uh, to say that it, it will refuse uh, to uh, to leave the victims alone or uh, to disengage, but also the necessity for the politics and the political answer to be very rational. Um, and and uh, we are in the need to take very quick decisions in terms of security, but, and it's exceptional to have to take such decisions, but we don't want to uh, have a state of exception that means to suspend uh, the principle of the rule of law, the principle of freedom, uh, of liberty. You mentioned uh, the Patriot Act reference, and it was openly discussed um, in France, in the National Assembly, and uh, in the press, uh, that even if we have to reinforce the uh, means and the, and the uh, legal framework in terms of intelligence, for example, of surveillance, uh, what comment des écoutes téléphoniques, wire, wire tap, and so on. Uh, we want to ensure that it will be done under the control of the judge and in such condition that it will not mean that uh, we renounce all the framework of protection of uh, personal uh, uh, liberty, data protection, and so on. That, that's a very complicated balance because we, we cannot be naive. Um, we also have to, to draw lessons from what happens. There was from some failures, obviously. Um, second thing is, uh, is Islamophobia. You're right, we must recognize and, and, and say perhaps more loudly, more clearly than before, and, and we are doing it since many months, that there is a, a new rise of anti-Semitism. That's why we have asked with some other member states of the United Nations for this general <coughs> session, which was uh, organized yesterday, that was uh, demanded months before, and, and because we think that uh, there is a need, not only in France and in Europe, but worldwide, to, to face this reality, including in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, so it's uh, an issue for uh, the United Nations, for the whole international community. But there is also another reality, especially in Western countries, in Europe, which is this racism against Islam. Uh, and uh, it's a propaganda from the uh, far right populist movement, but it's wider than that. And it's an exploitation of what happens in the Muslim world, of the war, of the terrorist attack. And that was also a part, I think, very clearly of the mobilization of the citizens, the 11th of January, the street of France, to say, we will not accept to designate uh, the Muslim people living in France, either French or immigrants, as the responsible of what happens. And, uh, was very important that uh, there was a strong and clear expression of imam, of uh, personality from the Muslim community, even if it's not very clear what is a Muslim community in a country like France, because we are not organized exactly in terms of community and because also the way 
the uh, religious uh, authority are organized in the Islam is not the same than in the Catholic Church. There's not a Pope, uh, there's not Archbishop, there's not Cardinal, there's Imam. They don't have a hierarchic relationship between one another. It's even different from the organization of the Jewish community <coughs> in France, where there is institutions which are linked to the history since Napoleon, uh, with consistoire, and after that, under the Republic, uh, there is a very uh, clear organization. So people can speak in the name of the community, even if a lot of Jewish people living in France would not consider themselves as represented by this organization. But in the Muslim community, it's not so easy. But in their diversity, a lot of people, either from the religious uh, organization of Muslim, either intellectuals, active citizens, which are from a Muslim background, spoke very loudly to say that, of course, they were shocked uh, and they wanted to be part of the mobilization of the French society against this terrorist attack. And it was very important. It, it helps to uh, have a, uh, an expression um, of a reaction which, which, which was firm, but which, which was of fraternity, too. And, and, and uh, that was a part of uh, uh, demonstration and we have to, uh, of course, also to be uh, aware that uh, any kind of uh, uh, Islamophobia uh, could be a victory for the terrorists and could, could encourage uh, uh, the radicalization of uh, some young people. Um, the zero tolerance in school, yes, you refer especially to, to the fact that uh, we, we decided and the Prime Minister, especially in front of the uh, National Assembly and the Minister for Education, to say very clearly that there has been many schools where young people refuse to uh, participate to the uh, uh, minute of silence or the minute of silence. Uh, and uh, that there was also some um, reaction of hostility against Charlie Hebdo, for example which shows that the things were not very clear uh, in their, in their uh, view. Uh, the distinction between the principle, refusal of terrorism, the, the preservation of freedom of expression, and the fact that, of course, you're not obliged to like Shang. <laughs> you're not obliged to appreciate a caricature, but, uh, but you cannot accept in a society of uh, freedom that someone will uh, threaten and, and kill a cartoonist just because you don't like that caricature. And uh, so we decided to, to say not to hide it and engage a discussion with uh, the children, with the, the students, and, uh, and to develop a new program of discussion in school. So we, we have now uh, uh, to also uh, train a uh, professor to deal with this issue. Um, as a part of their educational work, uh, how you deal with uh, the fact that some of the uh, students don't understand uh, this value uh, and so on. Thank, thank you. For uh, I'd like to hear a little more about this uh, from you as a member of the government, but also someone who has fought uh, for a long time against uh, racism in France. It seems to me that there's something you mentioned in your in your talk here that you know the, some of some of the events of the past ten years have not maybe raised enough indignation, and that maybe part of the problem here. I'm thinking of the assassination of Ilan Alimi years ago in France by a group of people who were calling themselves a gang of the barbarians uh, who killed someone after torturing him for about one day after kidnapping him. And that obviously was uh, absolutely uh, horrible. But uh, but uh, what now strikes me is actually in a way the lack <coughs> of collective mobilization at the time. It was you know obviously people spoke about it. I mean it was reported in the newspapers. People spoke about it. But that's one thing that 
did not, you know, go to the level of national mind or uh, didn't, uh, it seems to me, provoke at the time a national debate about what was going on. And in the past two weeks in France, a lot has resurfaced uh, from people who share the life of some of the kids you were referring to a few, a few minutes ago, the kids uh, who live in the suburbs and some teachers, social workers, doctors. And I'm seeking here, for example, of, of the very, very beautiful article by Lydie Salvaire in the Monde Libre uh, about 10 days ago, where she, she, she explained how she saw a lot of things and was, like a lot of people, trying to put it on the side <coughs> and dismiss it, because it was actually a little difficult to, um, to hear uh, such raw um, expressions of anti-Semitism in the mouth of, of, of five and six-year-olds. So uh, it is obviously a deficit of education. It is obviously also the result, as uh, Prime Minister Valls has said, of a form of French apartheid, a um, sense of divergent past, a sense also, it seems to me, of, as you were saying, of, 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 of lack of clarity. I think a lot of people in France at this point don't really know what freedom of expression means. But not only those people in the suburbs, those people who are not uh, rising to the need of, of silence, but a lot of people don't know. A lot of people, I think, are a little hesitant about what those uh, values of the Republic mean. And um, I understand it's a big question, but how do we go from there? I mean, what's, how do we rebuild? How do we rebuild a form of consensus? How do we <coughs> I understand training teachers is going to have an impact, but how do you change the mood? How do you um, how do you make how do you provoke indignation in people's um, um, mind and, and soul? How do you how do you do that? Well, I think you're right. It was a kind of denial uh, for for many years, um, probably because. It's not easy to recognize that there is still racism and especially anti-Semitism anti in, in a society uh, where it's supposed to have been uh, suppressed. Uh, it's easy also to, to think that it, it's just the problem of a minority, which is true, but then to say it's not significant. Um, after the, the murder of Ilan Alimi, and other uh, dramatic uh, aggression against the synagogues and the uh, Jewish uh, sites, uh, schools, you can always think uh, it's just because of uh, uh, really uh, specific barbarian groups. They call themselves, as you said, gone barbar. Uh, and when there was this murder in Toulouse uh, by Mohamed Merah, that was a shock, because that was not like previous terrorist attacks against Jewish people, which were dramatic, <coughs> but uh, which were, for example, uh, Rue Copernic, uh, more than 30 years ago, or uh, Rue des Rosiers, where it was foreign terrorist groups, which came in France to organize a terrorist attack. Uh, it was a young man from France. He was born, he was raised there. And um, unfortunately, even if it was uh, a kind of uh, awareness, but uh, it was not uh, um, a, a clear and, and, and general comprehension of what it means. Even if a, a, a lot of uh, intellectual, of professors, of NGOs have raised the point since many times that there was this problem of uh, uh, anti-Semitism uh, among young people uh, living in poor neighborhood. Uh, there was this discussion on, you know, this supposed comic, Vieux very popular. Used to be a partner of another uh, comic actor who was Jew. And, and, and with time, becoming a, a friend of a far-right extremist, a negationist, and popularizing through humor, anti-Semitism, 
in the name of anti-science and so on. Uh, and and for, for a long time, the reaction was not clear. It was like it's not significant. And at the time, the then Minister of Interior, Manuel Valls, now the Prime Minister, decided to um, call for justice for the uh, uh, forbidden of his uh, spectacle. Because there was extract of this show, which show that uh, which demonstrate that he was calling for murder uh, of journalists. In fact, saying he, he regrets that some of them were not killed during uh, the Nazi time uh, with a kind of joke, but which was not a joke at all. And, and there was a discussion in front: was it right or not to try to stop that kind of propaganda? You know, you stop the freedom of expression. So uh, now, this discussion uh, has to be led to, 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 you know, to the deep end of it, uh, very, very, very clearly. And you're right, there was a, a lack of clarity, a lack of reaction. That there has been a very violent attack uh, a few months ago in Créteil uh, against uh, the Jewish family uh, and, and, and the uh, criminal where they were arrested say they yes, we wanted to, to to get money and we knew that this family was Jew, we, we thought there would be money at their place and they tortured uh, the parents uh, waiting for the children and uh, they insult them uh, with uh, anti Semitic uh, words. It was very clear the motivation. But there was a little demonstration only. It was like if it something you can do anything about it. So I think we, we have to, to engage uh, very clearly. How do we rebuild this uh, gathering um, the uh, Sunday 11th of January it was really something very important I think, for French people. It was like a, a will of the citizen to say uh, we will not let other people decide of uh, our future of uh, the kind of society we will live in. And uh, everybody has to, to be part of a kind of reconstruction uh, of this future. Of course, to uh, say, uh, to fight against uh, terrorism and, uh, uh, and this violent group, but also to, to, uh, uh, to fight against this, this kind of uh, ideology of, uh, uh, of hate, of, uh, of decomposition of the society. So, this is a very important moment. So now, the uh, political uh, leaders from all the parties, majority, opposition, will have to, to be able to bring the needed answer. Uh, and it's very complicated, first because we are a democracy, and it's absolutely normal that there is uh, controversy, uh, contradiction uh, that we accept, that on the many issues, on the economic policy, social policy, perhaps even the foreign affair policy, there could be different views and, 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 and a discussion. But I think also in that kind of moment, there is a need of very strong national unity uh, on what is essential, and especially to avoid that on the kind of answer we have to bring to this uh, situation, there is a kind of tactical uh, utilization of the, co of the problems. Because you could imagine, I don't know if it's exactly what happens here in the United States after 9-11. Some people, some American friends told me that it happens that way. That after a time of unity, you have some of the people who say, but well, of course we have to be democratic, to be uh, an open society, but the reality is that we have enemies, a part of the enemies are in the society, or trying to, to come in the society, so uh, the core answer must be uh, the war against uh, uh, our enemy. And another part of the society say, uh, no, the problem is a social uh, and integration problem, uh, or our relationship with uh, the outside world, uh, with uh, uh, the Muslim world, and then you can either try to combine, you know, the two aspects, or you, you can oppose it and make it an argument for the political 
divide in the population in the election and so on. So there is a kind of, comment uh, d'exigence, uh, I think, in this situation for the political uh, leader, uh, for the government and the opposition to be able not to use the difficulties to build contradiction, but to try to, to build from the contradiction a common answer. And it's not in the nature of the political life. Perhaps especially in countries where we, we like the political uh, the discussion, controversy. controversy. So that, that, that's something uh, which will ask a lot, a lot of uh, responsibility, uh, a lot of sense of uh, the uh, general interest over the uh, particular interest of each party. Um, for the, the two last weeks, the atmosphere was, was new, was different in National Assembly, in the political discussion. But we have to face a lot of other issues on which uh, uh, also, I think citizens now are waiting uh, a, a new approach. This crisis and, and, and this strong mobilization, the 11th of January, uh, create a kind of new spirit. It doesn't um, suppress the problem existing before, but it, it demands to answer to them with a new manner. And that's, that's a challenge now, uh, and that's what we have to do. So, uh, if I could push you just a little bit more on this point that Emmanuel made and that was brought up earlier, which is, um, so you mentioned um, the contradictions, you know, as an old Marxist would say, um, you know, one of the great things that crises can do is they not only reflect tensions and contradictions in society, but they can exacerbate them. And it seems like here's a clear example of exactly that phenomenon, which is what this has revealed, um, is that in addition to having some you know, sort of crazy people willing to commit pretty crazy acts, that there is a large percentage of um, French and European societies that are quite alienated from the mainstream. And clearly this is something that perhaps should have been recognized before, but is very obvious now. And um, this um, educational initiative, which obviously um, has deep roots in French history, has already been mentioned. But clearly there has to be more than that, right? Because this is a problem that um, is deep. It's broad and is not going to go away anytime soon. So besides some educational initiatives, what ways do you think this kind of problem, of these kinds of incredibly alienated um, citizens, how you think this could best be addressed by France in particular, but perhaps by um, Europe and other places more generally? And then um, the second question I'd like to ask is, um, you've obviously also been um, deeply involved and are deeply involved with the French Socialist Party. And so um, one of the things that um, I'd like to hear maybe a little bit more about is um, how you see this impacting um, sort of the French political scene. Because again, you could see this going in a variety of different ways. I mean, it could also um, polarize the French political system further, playing into the hands of those who um, are best at exploiting fear and exploiting hate. Um, it might also mobilize other groups, perhaps the left, um, to rethink the way it's addressed questions of alienation, um, fear among its citizens, and come up with better ways of addressing these problems, which clearly, for many people, um, it's been easier to avoid than to address head on. I think, um, as a student of much of the European left, um, my feeling is that these are difficult questions. They're questions that, relate, that raise a variety of quandaries for people on the left, in particular, who um, like to stand for tolerance, who have sympathies for multiculturalism and have allowed those to um, uh, let them not address problems that in particular many of their constituents are finding um, are being now addressed by other groups and other political parties. And so we've seen this kind of slippage from the left in particular of um, its traditional working class constituency. Um, and they're there now to be mobilized on um, fears and concerns that the left has for too long not addressed. And so I wonder, again, if this crisis might, um, you think, um, spark some rethinking on the left of how to deal not just with these um, problems of alienation, but with the fears and concerns that clearly many um, French citizens have, because um, otherwise they'll be addressed clearly by other parties, and they may end up, therefore, benefiting from this crisis in a very um, worrisome and problematic way. Yes, I, I think you're right. If, if 
you don't address the major concern of the country, of, of, of uh, a large part of the citizen, uh, the issue of the national identity, uh, the issue of uh, the sharing of the French uh, Republic value, as it was mentioned by uh, Bernard Court, uh, the issue of security. If the left is not able to address that issues, it's addressed by other people. But we have to address it and show that you can bring answers which are not the answer of the populist, of the nationalist, of the anti-European uh, groups. And that's a, a challenge for the left everywhere in Europe. Um, but I think on the other right also, the uh, conservative or uh, right-wing centre-right party have also to address the issue of social cohesion, uh, the issue of uh, uh, education, <laughs> the issue of the need of uh, public services. So that's what's at stake now. Um, and, 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 and that's the challenge. I think the left will remain the left, the right wing party will remain uh, what they are. It's deeply uh, in our history, there's different uh, current, but there is a moment where in every nation history, and it already happens in the past for France too, you have to over, overcome these differences. It, it doesn't mean you will dissolve it, but it's a necessity for the cohesion of the, of the nation to be able to, to build a common answer. It's not very easy to, to do comparison, and it, it has a lot of limits. But for example, after the Second World War, there has to uh, draw lesson from what brings to uh, the collapse of the Republic, to the uh, compromission of the Vichy uh, regime with the uh, Nazi uh, occupation and so on. And, and there was something uh, in a group of people in the Conseil National de la Résistance which defined for a time the consensus on which we build uh, the Republic with uh, uh, the democratic value but more social dimension and De Gaulle was the, the, the leader of that process, even if it goes on after for, for a time without him. And after that, the democratic confrontation begin again, but on a new basis. Um, and I think, for many reasons, linked to this attack on our core value and on, on our security, but also because of this debate for many years on uh, the relationship between France and its social model and the globalization and the need to, to find a way to reform the country, its economy, its social and, and, and the, uh, public service system without but with no renounce thing to its social core model. We need this, this kind of new unity. That, that's very difficult. We are not in Germany where Regularly, it's, it's not the, the general rules, but it happens every, let's say, 20 years, we have uh, what they call Grand Coalition, Grosse Coalition, <laughs> because they are obliged by their electoral system also to have a majority, but also because the people want it, and then you have a compromise, uh, and, and that's the situation now with uh, Mrs. Merkel and the SPD. It's not very easy to do this in France, it doesn't exist uh, really. But, in fact, it exists in many other European countries. And you, when you look at it, it's, of course, something you can discuss because, uh, for example, in Sweden, they have broke a kind of deal like that between uh, the new left uh, government and the, the, the right, uh, centre-right opposition, because otherwise it is the extremists which decided of the politics. And you can say, when you do this, you leave to the extremists the monopoly of the opposition. So it can be dangerous. But on the other way, you also uh, ensure the possibility for a majority, large majority in the country to, to build a consensus on what can be and has to be changed. In the globalization, uh, all of our society are obliged to, to, to change, especially European countries, because we have a uh, very solid uh, social system and public services system 
that we, which were been before the globalization era, uh, 60 years ago. Uh, so we actually have to change it. It's very difficult because we don't want to, to, to suppress our uh, system of solidarity, of cohesion. And it's very difficult to do it if you don't have a consensus to do it. So I think that this event also uh, shows the necessity to uh, gather uh, the society and its representation on what is absolutely essential. What, what we want to preserve and to represent in, in the world of tomorrow. We want to, to remain society of freedom, of diversity, of solidarity. Uh, we don't uh, accept to renounce to that and uh, even if we have to, to lead a war against enemy, we don't want to become war society. Uh, we have also to reinforce the European unity. None of our country can face the challenges of globalization, of terrorism, of security, of preserving uh, a, a space of, a, of a democracy uh, if we don't cooperate more closely. We are obliged to, to accept some more step in European integration. And it's not very easy because there is uh, this nationalist and populist movement. So I think uh, if you look at all the uh, demands on, on, on this time, it has a lot of implication even for the left. And you're right, how, how do you uh, adapt to this but uh, while preserving what is your values, your history, your identity, and this has to be discussed now. <laughs> uh, hello, so uh, my name is Louise and I'm a student here in Colombia from, from Paris, majoring in urban studies. And uh, I mean, thank you for mentioning all these key issues uh, describing the, yeah, the event. I was just wondering, you mentioned education, and uh, and to me this is a, yeah, like a key institution to um, just spread values of tolerance and uh, and you know uh, not like uh, anti anti racism and all those kind of things. Uh, so I was wondering where, for example, you would start considering social mixity in schools, uh, and then how, uh, for example, Manuel Valls mentioned the the apartheid à la française, which is indeed increasing, and our cities are becoming more and more. Um, separate in terms of district, in terms of, of good schools, and uh, and where the children of of wealthy families go, and some of them are like families uh, that are for the social mixity but not for their own kids, which could also be problematic. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I was wondering, for example, in terms of la carte scolaire and these kind of things, like where the left party would stand here, and and uh, yeah, and how to deal with it. Another question, questions related to that, we have to go back here. Hi, uh, my name is Noelle. I'm a graduate student at SIPA, uh, School of International Public Affairs in Security. Um, and you mentioned that Gidoni, um was popularizing anti-Semitism. And so I was wondering if, in your opinion, the kinds of cartoons that Charlie Hebdo <laughs> is uh, publishing sh could be considered popularizing Islamophobia and if there's a critical difference between the two and how you would respond to someone who said that there was a um, double standards in liberty of expression which has been coming up a lot in social media because Judone did receive a lot of pushback with things being cancelled, uh, his skit being cancelled and things like that. So how would you address the issues that are being raised? Thank you. Yes, on school um, segregation, uh, neighborhood segregation, urban segregation, that's, that's a major issue. And, and it, it also leads to the issue of mo social mobility or, or reproduction of inequality. And, and that's a, a real risk for, for a country like France, where uh, one of the principles of the Republic is the meritocracy. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, the, um, what we call the Grandes Écoles, um, kind of public uh, um, high school, uh, um, in the past it was a way to ensure that uh, young people coming from all social backgrounds could become part of the elite. 
Now, if you look at the most prestigious one, like Polytechnic or LENA, especially LENA, which doesn't only provide the uh, uh, ICD servant, but also, in fact, uh, people who are leading the, the, the most important uh, private companies, uh, perhaps half of the uh, pupils are children of former uh, ch uh, yeah, students of this, of this school. It means they are the children of the elite, um, and, and it's uh, really a, a failure for us. Not, not so the quality of the school is a very good one, but uh, the fact that we are not able to open more to uh, categories of, uh, of young people and, and of population coming from <coughs> everywhere, the access uh, to the elite. And uh, so we, are, we have to really engage a, a strong reform of the, the way um, public housing uh, has become so, uh, so polarized so segregated, because if you have a uh, wide neighborhood that exists also here in the US, but where you have only uh, people from the same origin, especially if they are from uh, immigrant background, poor uh, condition, it's absolutely clear that you create the condition of exclusion and uh, uh, again, terror, come on, terror. Um, there is a basis, you know, for for hatred, for radicalization, for rupture with the, the mainstream uh, society. And of course, you put uh, in danger the credibility of the value of the republic, the value of equality, uh, of fraternity. So uh, we think that the answer is to give to the schools in this neighborhood more, uh, more means, more professor. Um, and, and to, to, to work on the neighborhood constitutions themselves. It will be very long. It's absolutely fair. But that's not a reason to, to say we will begin in, in one year or in two years. We have to begin now. But it will be very long. It has begun in some places. It has been possible because, you know, the story of this neighborhood is that in the 50s and the 60s, we built a lot of uh, project housing in the suburbs of the cities, especially Paris suburbs, but not only, you know, you go to Lyon, Lille, everywhere. There was a lot of people coming both from uh, countryside and from immigration going to these places. But it was mixed at the beginning, and that was during the Trente Glorieuse. It was a time of full employment and of very strong social mobility. At that time, the children of uh, um, <coughs> you, uh, workers, uh, yes, but workers, I mean, uh, uh, factory workers, they could uh, opt to become uh, employees, which was supposed to be, to be better, you know, and, uh, and uh, the cab, uh, and so on. There was a social ascension. But in um, the 70s, with the beginning of the industrial crisis in, in France, and the 80s, with the uh, rising of unemployment, especially in this uh, category of population, uh, these places were lived by the middle class. So it was only working class, former working class, but a lot of unemployed people living there, among them a majority of immigrants. Then those district become, because that was not the situation at the beginning, become uh, identified to immigration, and then all the people who are not from immigrant background try to leave. And progressively, in the 80s, the 90s, it becomes ghetto of immigrant people. So there was a discussion among the sociologists, because it was not the same kind of ghetto, of urban ghetto, than in the US. Some say it's not a ghetto because it's not only people from Algeria, for example. No, that's right. It was also people from Mali, from Tunisia, uh, from Morocco, uh, from Senegal. But it becomes a kind of ghetto. And it's something, I, I grew up in one of these districts. There was a lot of immigrant people, but when I turned to uh, my school um, uh, friends, pale uh, in school, there was young friends from all origin. But if you look at the same place 20 years after, for a young uh, schoolboy, 
you will look around him and you will see only black people or Arabs people. That's different. Because it, it means something about the society and the, the way you're treated, you know? Especially in France, which is not a society of community, where uh, the mixed city is supposed to be uh, a part of the, the fact to be uh, in a universal uh, citizenship uh, nation. So this is, of course, a, a very important uh, chantier. Uh, the question of the double standard. That's needed to be explained, of course. There is, a, for us, a difference between what was done and is done by these cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo, who are people very, very clear about their anti-racist uh, commitment and, and, and very generous people. Uh, they uh, make fun of religion, uh, of uh, institution, <laughs> but in fact they, they never, and, and they try sometimes, the limit is not easy, they say, recognize it, but they don't uh, attack um, people for what they believe, uh, and they will never call for hatred, for murder, for destruction of people, and, and they will also be uh, equitable in a way. I mean, they, they are able of self-humor. Um, huh? That's a real humor, is when you're able of self-humor. But, je uh, it's not about that. It, it's about denying uh, the reality of uh, the Shoah uh, and regretting that there was not more people killed in it. So, of course, you can say, you can make people laugh uh, about that, but it's very clear, it, it's a call to, uh, to a trade. Um, and, and we defend in France the freedom of expression, uh, the freedom to, uh, to, to criticize uh, what, whoever you, you want, every belief, but not to call for discrimination or for hate or for violence against people because of what they are, of their religion, uh, of their belief, of their background. And um, of course, it's, it's, it's need to be explained, but, but it's a very clear distinction for us. First of all, I'd like to thank the minister. Uh, as a member of a national Jewish organization fighting anti-Semitism in France, with people on the in Europe, with people on the ground in France and elsewhere in Europe, I think you are justifiably correct in saying that the French government, in particular Prime Minister Valls, uh, especially when he was Interior Minister during this past summer, did heroic efforts to fight anti-Semitism, and we should be justifiably proud of that. But I would like to raise an issue with Professor Arkwood. Uh, you were talking about Islamophobia. Islamophobia in the concept of the United Nations, where the Islamic countries are trying to put it on a par with anti-racism and anti-Semitism, is, as I understand it, an attempt to um, uh, put down freedom of speech and justifiable criticism of Islam in general, and is. Uh, not really on a par with either racism or anti-Semitism. Particularly in the concept of the United Nations. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I was just reading my Libération, I think it was this morning. Uh, there have been as many acts of Islamophobe in the last two weeks in 2015 than there have been in all of 2014. Um, and uh, with pictures of, you know, uh, an attempted uh, arson on the mosque at uh, Poitiers, etc. So um, I think that those that and the the problems that are associated with a different conception of free speech in France than in America, right? I mean, it's it's very different. Um, create legitimate issues to deal with and difficult issues to deal with. And um, I think that particularly when we're dealing with trying to instill liberal values of tolerance, right, which I take it as, I mean, there are two things, there are two important elements here. There's an element of social conditions, which is the, what uh, Prime Minister Bowles was talking about in terms of uh, the social conditions, and those need to be addressed. But then there's also this 
issue of instilling liberal values. And it's not clear to me that, in, that one can instill liberal values in a kind of, in a way that doesn't allow for expression um, for all kinds of expression. So this is, this is a sharp difference in something that's deeply uh, difficult between the United States and France. But I think it's something that's at the, at the center of uh, French consciousness right now and probably needs to be addressed. Um, I would like to I have two questions about Europe. Um, first, as a member of the European Parliament, you were ranked 750 seconds out of 766 in terms of acidity. So do you think that you were the best choice for the Secretary of State for European Arts? And second, I would like to know what is the position of the Parti Socialiste and the French government about the TTIP uh, in French. Going back to what you're saying, how uh, after the, the attacks, there's been an effort on the European level to share information and data about passengers. Do you actually think these efforts are going to be passed by the European Parliament, who's routinely blocked them in the past based on privacy concerns? And more onto that, do you think that this outrage that's happening in Europe right now, like calling for greater reform, calling for stricter counterterrorism measures, is going to last, or is this kind of a flash in the pan, and things will like calm down in a few weeks and people will be less concerned about these issues? Um, I have one question. France has a population of, has a Jewish population of close to 500,000 people. And on his recent visit, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made a passionate call to, the, to French Jews to consider moving to Israel. What would be your response to that in light of recent attacks? And I just wanted you to respond to, were you not minister, but still in charge of SOS Passis? How would you respond to this today? Thank you for, for your question, but, um, You know, I've been the first secretary of the Socialist Party for uh, two years. And when you are the leader of a party, usually you are a member of parliament, but you uh, made the choice for the time of this leadership, which is you go to parliament to vote the law, but you, you uh, spend most of your time to national politics and uh, to uh, your participation to uh, the national debate. And that's the same for all the political leader of party. Uh, and I think it's needed that uh, uh, the first uh, secretary, or whatever is the term, general secretary of a party in a democracy is elected uh, and is a member of parliament. That's a, a question of uh, legitimacy. But obviously, when you are the head of a party, you're not the president of a commission in the parliament, and you don't have the same kind of participation. You rely on your colleague than when you're just a simple member of parliament. I invite you to take my statistic. Uh, for the other years, and, and you will understand why uh, I think uh, some people have considered that I was, uh, um, I think, could uh, make confidence in me to be a Secretary of State for European Affairs, and including my relationship with my former colleague in the European Parliament, because one of my tasks now is to work with them and to ensure the good relationship between European Parliament and uh, the French uh, government. Uh, and that leads me to the question to uh, the TTIP and the uh, PNR. Uh, the TTIP, so that's this trade uh, agreement between the US and, and the European Union, which is uh, negotiated now. Uh, we think uh, it could be um, uh, a benefit of uh, the two uh, uh, parties in terms of uh, economy. Uh, but uh, it's a very difficult uh, negotiation because uh, there's a wide range of uh, subjects, uh, agriculture, uh, public procurement, uh, investment, uh, uh, all kinds of uh, services, uh, financial services, and so on, but also the, the norms. Uh, and uh, of course, each block has its own uh, defensive and offensive interest, but um, uh, I think that um, it is in, um, in the interest of, of uh, our companies on both sides uh, to have the ability to export more to our market. But there is also some uh, elements which will remain very clearly of the competencies of uh, each uh, 
of uh, the, the two blocks because it's two democracy. And for example, uh, when you organize that kind of uh, trade uh, deal, uh, you have also to preserve uh, the fact that uh, we don't have exactly the same conception of uh, the norms for the uh, sanitary uh, uh, protection, for example. We don't accept GMO in Europe. We don't accept uh, almond beef and so on. And we will not renounce to that because of the trade deal. So that's, uh, of course, the discussion. And I don't go into the detail of the other aspect. But on the other side, for example, for uh, our agriculture uh, project, it's very important to have a protection of uh, what we call the um, geographical indication, uh, which doesn't exist nowadays in the, in the trade commercial uh, uh, relationship between uh, Europe and, and the US. It exists now with Canada. We have, we have put this in a, in a trade deal. So there is a lot to win. And uh, we also want this uh, discussion to be laid with more transparency than it has been done now. Uh, I understand that that's a sort of preoccupation for you, and that's a very clear demand uh, of our government, and uh, it's justified because it concerns uh, the economic organization of uh, a lot of sectors in Europe and, and in the US, but also because at the end of the day, it will be submitted to a parliamentary ratification. And in Europe, it means 28 national parliaments will have to ratify this uh, trade deal treaty and the European Parliament. So uh, it's absolutely uh, clear that uh, if you don't uh, transmit information and associate the representative of the people to uh, the negotiation, there will, be, there will be a problem. On the PNR, that was another question. Yes, there was a problem with the European Parliament. We, we hope it will be solved. One of the reasons the, the European Parliament refused to uh, support, because the European Parliament has a lot of power, legislative power, and we need uh, an endorsement, a vote, uh, by the European Parliament for this uh, PNR uh, system to be, to be put in place in Europe, is that they wanted to guarantee on data protection, on uh, the fact that it will not lead to a, 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 a kind of general uh, Fichage, uh, um, uh, record uh, of uh, everyone for for no security reason. Uh, I think this uh, preoccupation can be can be answered, but it's absolutely clear that if there is not a PNR, the European PNR, uh, which you know, I don't know if everybody knows what, what it is about. It means that the uh, airline <laughs> have to transmit to the administration uh, the uh, dossier uh, of their passengers and so it ensures the uh, intelligence service services that they, they can uh, be informed if some people who are in their file as terrorists or supposed terrorists or participating to terrorist uh, group that they are going to take a flight to go to a, sp a specific place and for example if you see that uh, some people, uh, you know, they take a flight in Paris, once for Roma, once for Barcelona, once for Copenhagen, but at the end they take another flight and they go to Ankara, and that's one of the places where you can go to Syria, so you can know that there is a problem, you know. And for example, Medina Mouche, who is the uh, uh, terrorist who does the attack against the Jewish, Jewish Museum in Brussels, he arrived in Brussels probably by car or bus, but before that he, he arrived from <coughs> Turkey to uh, and elsewhere, take different flights to uh, uh, Frankfurt Airport. Uh, but you know, it's not transmitted to anyone, even if it was signaled that he has lived months ago, years ago, probably to Syria. So it's absolutely clear that we need that kind of instrument. And if it is not put in place at European level, you will have 28 national PNR with no harmonization of the information. So it will not be very efficient. And there will be not a clear framework for the protection of freedom of data, uh, personal data. So 
we are discussing with your environment and we wish there will be a, an outcome very soon. Uh, the call of Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel, Israel Prime Minister, uh, to French uh, Jews to go to Israel, well, it's a tradition. Huh? <laughs> that's clear that, uh, that uh, the Prime Minister of Israel will call the Jews in the world to come to Israel. But we are also very clear it's freedom, individual freedom of choice. Everybody has a right to, to, to make this choice. But we want the Jews living in France to stay in France. They are part of France. And as Manuel Valls, Prime Minister, and François Hollande say, France without Jews is not France. And uh, it's a whole country who is mobilized to uh, ensure the security of uh, the, Jew, the French Jews so that they can stay in France. We want them to stay in France. It's their homeland. It's their nation. They are part of the history of this country. And uh, it's from century. It's not from yesterday. And, and so it's a clear battle for us to ensure the security, but also to convince the Jewish people to stay in France. It's impossible to accept the idea that people will leave France because they don't feel its security for what they are, uh, and, and, and because they don't feel protected. So they will be all the mobilizations. They are protected. They are part of this nation. And we want this nation to be a nation where people, uh, whatever they are, Jews, Muslim, Catholic, uh, black, white, uh, coming from any part of the world, if they are in this country, because they are children to be in this country, they are part of this nation, they have to stay in this nation, which wants them to stay in this nation. Thank you.